one more person after Neil. No, but in all his stages. Yeah, there's, there's other people here. But there's no one here. Not yet. What do you mean? Speakers or audience? Ooh. It's true, but I remember there's a live tweet which is online. It's not. I know the physical presence is not great, but live on the internet. Which isn't always bad, you know. People at home maybe. Better than that. Yeah, no. Oh. Yeah. A lot of people they come yeah. in halfway through. Alright, that one was fine. Uh, uh, let me just run from there. Um, so we're gonna have 45 minutes to speak with a 10 minute question answer at the end of the show. Um, when there's about 10 minutes left of the presentation, I'll hold a 10 minute, a 10 card up. Okay. Five, five, and then there's one minute one. It's up to you how long you're gonna go, but I'll, yeah, you have roughly about. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are, this is Campus Party 2013. This is the Galileo stage. I'm your host of the day and the week, Aaron. Now we've reached our penultimate speaker of the night. It is Mr. Neil Harbison on a talk of cybernetics. He'll be talking about the, connection, the extension of the human body and the connection between software and the brain. Now, round of applause for Mr. Neil Harbison, please. Well, I was born with this rare visual condition called achromatism, which is total color blindness. So I've never seen color. I don't know what blue looks like. I don't know what red looks like because I've always seen in grayscale. So from an early age, I always wanted to extend my senses and perceive color because even though you don't see color, you can't ignore that color exists because color is absolutely everywhere. It's in uh, all kind of subjects. Yellow pages, Bluetooth, Greenpeace, orange and red cross, for example, are five elements that have nothing to do with the beauty of color but contain color names that reminded me every day that color existed and that I couldn't perceive it. There's also other things like Red Bull, Pink Panther, Yellow Submarine, Blue Tack, the Green Card, there's also James Brown or Brownies. There's even a whole country called Greenland which is not even green but contains the color and then this is what made me feel like separated from society. So the reason why I wanted to extend my senses and perceive color was not because I wanted to perceive the beauty of color, but because color is a social element that is in every single subject of our lives. Also, color, when it's used as a code, is very annoying because you know automatically which one's the hot water and which one's the cold water, but I need to test both taps to see which one's which. Also, when color is used as a code, it can be quite confusing this is fine but if I go to Tokyo and the map is solely based in color then you can easily get lost also there's this strange situation where three completely different countries share exactly the same flag so it's a social element that made me feel uh, that I was missing something also when uh, there's color as a definition or in, in literature if someone asks me have you seen a man with ginger hair blue eyes and dressed in pink I would have no idea if I've seen this person because the only information I get is that the man has hair, that he has eyes, and that he's not naked. So the reason why I wanted to perceive color was because I felt socially excluded from uh, the rest of the world, basically, because everyone uses color every day. So every day of your life, you're reminded that color exists. Now, I studied piano because piano seemed to be the only element that contained no color. It's a black and white instrument and music seems to be something not related to color. But when I studied music, I realized that there's been many theories in, in history that relate color to sound. Like Newton made the first scale that related each note of the scale to a specific color. And then there were many more physicians and composers that used color to sound scale. So I, I realized that I would never be able to ignore color because it's even in music. And I felt quite interested in this relationship between color and sound because I can perceive sound. So if I can perceive sound, I thought maybe through sound I'll be able to perceive color. So we started the project in 2003 because uh, one day at Dartington College of Arts, Adam Montandon came and he gave a, a, a talk about how we could use cybernetics to extend our senses. So I was interested in this particular use of cybernetics so that I could 
uh, extend my senses and perceive color in some way. So we started this project and we decided that the best way for me to perceive color would be to use sound. And we created this first prototype, which was a webcam connected to a five kilo computer with a software and then a pair of headphones that would transform the colors in front of me into sound waves and then I would hear the colors in front of me through the software. So we started with just the main colors and I memorized the sound of red, the sound of orange, the sound of yellow and I kept memorizing the, the sound of each uh, specific note until my brain just got used to hearing color and then we added more colors. So we added like 12 colors and then when my brain got used to it we added more 24 and then 48 and we kept upgrading the software until we got to the 360 different uh, colors 360 different notes for each degree of the color wheel so that was in 2007 when I was able to differentiate the sound of these um, uh, if you can hear now there's, there's microtones going from F to F sharp now so between F and F sharp, there's no uh, space in a piano, but I have 30 notes between F and F sharp, which is like going from red to orange, and then from F sharp to G, I have 30 more notes, which is like going from orange to yellow, and it keeps going up and up. It's a pure sine wave, so it's an electronic sound, and um, at the beginning it was quite annoying because it was so much information because there's color absolutely everywhere, but my brain just got used to hearing color. And at the beginning, everything was just information. I had to memorize the sound, but after some time, this information became a perception. I didn't have to think about the sound of the color. It was just automatic. And after years, it just became a feeling. I started to have favorite colors. So it goes up, up until here, which is which are the, these are the higher pitches. So this is how I perceive hue, but then there's a, another property of color, which is saturation. So I could perceive hue with different notes. I could perceive the light of the color with my eyes, but I was missing the saturation of color, which is if a color is very vivid or dull. So we had a different um, volume levels depending on, if, on the, color, the color's um, energy. So if a color is very dull, I hear it in a lower volume, and if a color is very alive, it's very vivid, I hear it in a higher volume. Now, I designed different headsets so that it would become more comfortable to wear the electronic eye. I tried different things. First thing I did was to cut the headphones in half because I couldn't hear people when I was uh, hearing color. So, half of the, I had half to hear people and the other half to listen to color. Then the other thing was to reduce the computer from 5 kilos to 2 kilos. So I, was, I just lost like 3 kilos in one day because I reduced 3 kilos from my backpack. The other thing I did then was to reduce it to 1 kilo computer which was uh, attached to my body for like 3 years. And then the, the biggest change was in 2010 when I stopped using a computer and I started using a chip. So now instead of using a whole laptop, I have a chip installed at the back of my head. And the other change was to stop using my ears to hear color and to start using my bone. So now I hear color through bone conduction instead of air conduction, which made a huge difference and a huge change because we all have the bones which conduct sound. So we could all actually use our bone to hear color instead of or to hear anything instead of using our ears. So now I have like two uh, different audio inputs. I have the visual sounds which come through bone conduction and the audio sounds which come through air conduction and this separates separates what's visual from what's auditive now the next change is um, just to have um, the eye work the antenna inside the bone now it's pressuring from the outside so it's pressuring the bone but I want to have this inside the bone so that I have like a mini jack entry the operation has been accepted and now the final design of the antenna has also been uh, uh, designed, so we, I'm, we're just waiting for the final bioethical committee approval that will allow me to have the antenna inside the bone. Then when this is done, I want to start working on human battery because I need to plug myself every four or five days and I don't want to depend on electricity. I don't want to plug myself. I just want to use my own energy to charge the chip. So I want to use my blood 
circulation to charge the chip with a small turbine in the blood vessel and this should allow me to to renew to to recharge without having to depend on external energy now after years of hearing color my brain has been modified has modified itself um, this is my brain scan in may last year they've detected that whenever i see something visual the auditory part of my brain activates because i'm so used to hearing color that whenever i see any image of the sky my sound uh, part of the brain activates and creates the sound of the sky if someone shows me the image of black and white oranges my brain will create f sharp so my brain creates the sound of color not the software and this is also what happens when i dream when i dream my brain creates electronic sounds so i can dream in color it's not the chip creating the electronic sounds but my brain when this started to happen is when i felt this strong union between the cybernetics and my brain that's when my brain started to sound like a software is when i felt uh, this strong connection between cybernetics and organism that's the word cyborg that's when i started to feel cyborg when i started to feel no difference between the electronic extension and my brain i started to feel that the software had become an extension of my senses an extension of my brain and this is no longer an external device but a part of my body i don't feel that i'm using technology i don't feel that i'm wearing technology i feel that i am technology and this is a strange feeling that started to happen little by little especially when i started to to hear colors in my dreams now i had a problem in 2004 because i wasn't allowed to renew my uk passport because there's a law that says that electronic equipment is not allowed on passport photos so i wrote to them because they rejected my passport photo and i replied to them saying that what they were saying was not an electronic equipment but a new part of my body and that it should they should consider the antenna as an extension of my body therefore an extension of my image but they replied saying that this was still not allowed that they sh i should have some kind of doctor's proof so my doctor also wrote a letter and we started like a campaign so that they would allow me to to appear in the passport with uh, the electronic eye and they finally did but it was uh, after a few months i still appear with the first electronic eye i should renew it to the new uh, eye but it still uh, it helps me a lot when i travel so no one can actually force me to take the electronic eye off it also helps when i'm in public places because there's many shops and places like um, churches or cinemas where they don't allow me in because they think i'm gonna film the film for example or if i go to a supermarket they think that i'm uh, like spying or that i come from somewhere else that i'm doing some kind of illegal thing so having it on the passport helps also in venice people thought that i was working for google view and that i was kind of scanning the whole city so it helps to have it on the passport now when i was able to perceive color just like you I, I realized that there's many many more colors that humans cannot perceive but that colors exist like infrareds or ultraviolet there's many many more colors so i didn't see why i should stop to human perception so i decided in 2010 to continue extending my color perception and i added infrared colors and ultraviolet colors to the sensor so since then i can actually perceive more colors than a human eye because i can perceive near ultra uh, ultraviolet and near uh, infrared which for example if i go to a shop or a bank i can tell if the alarms are on or off if the movement detectors are on or off because i can hear the infrared and in many occasions they're off so it's quite surprising that you would find so many shops having uh, alarms that are off also infra no ultraviolet helps you know if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe because if you hear ultraviolet then you know that it can damage your skin ultraviolet is a color that can kill you because it's so intense that can go through the skin and cause some kind of um, skin damage so i think we should all have this interest to perceive at least ultraviolet because it's a dangerous color this is the new sonochromatic scale since i hear uh, infrared and ultraviolet so my daily life has changed in many ways one of them is the way i dress because before i used to dress in a way that it looked good now i dress in a way that it sounds good so i decide what notes i want to wear in the morning and then i choose the chord combination depending on how i want to sound so if i want to dress in c major i would wear this type of combination which is more or less what i'm wearing today i'm wearing a major chord if i went 
to a funeral, I would wear this combination because it's a minor chord. And this would be just dressed as a clown or as a song because depending on the patterns you draw, you can actually wear a specific song. So we're also designing this uh, collection of clothes so that you can um, decide what you want to wear as a song. We've created, for example, this is a tie that sounds like Sega Bodega. It sounds like this. So this is the sound of, of that tie, but you could wear anything. We're actually designing um, also a wedding march so that you can actually wear the we wedding march in your wedding so you don't need to pay for an orchestra. You can be the, the wedding march. Or also you can design um, like, uh, what is the wood? How do you call them? The uh? coffins with a requiem. So it would be very colorful, but it would, you would have a, a requiem coffin. Also, food has changed a lot because now food has sound, so I can actually eat songs depending on how I distribute the, the food on a plate. So we're actually thinking of creating this menu that you can go to a restaurant and ask for some Lady Gaga desserts or like just any, any type of music, like a Vivaldi as the main dish. So depending on how you put the, the color of the food on the plate, you can eat the song. So the important thing will not be its taste, but its sound. This is, for example, how some, th some of the things you find... You, you can compose music by looking at things now. So now instead of playing an instrument, I just uh, look at things and, and that's how I create music. I just uh, can create music by looking at specific colors or faces or anything that has color and compose music by looking and the frequencies. So my experience of walking along or walking around a supermarket has changed a lot because it's like going to a nightclub because supermarkets have so many colors that it's like so music, electronic music everywhere. Milk is silent. So white things and black things don't sound. If there's no color, there's no frequency, so there's no sound. Now, my experience of supermarkets has changed, but also my experience of walking into a museum. So if I go to any type of museum, I I'll be able to listen to a Picasso or, or listen to a, a, an Andy Warhol. Like I can listen to visual art, so it gives me a completely different experience of any kind of painting. I can hear the scream because uh, this is how it sounds can't hear it very well but Andy Warhol for example has very high volume paintings because he used a lot of saturation so you can hear an Andy Warhol from far away whereas more classical paintings have less saturation so you can't really hear them from this is a less saturated painting it has many more microtones so you could actually know what you're looking at without looking at it. You could just listen and you would easily know if it's a Picasso or a Dali or an Andy Warhol because they all sound very differently. So the way I perceive beauty or the canons of beauty has changed as well because it's not only someone's face, the shape of the face, what is important now is also how the person sounds. So m someone might look very good, but might sound terrible, or it might happen the other way around. Someone might, might look very bad, but sound really, really good. So I'm interested now in creating sound portraits, where instead of drawing someone's face, drawing the shape of someone's face, I just get close to the face and I write down the frequencies, the color, the sound of their eyes, the sound of the lips, the sound of the skin and the sound of the hair and this creates a specific sound point. So each person sounds different, no matter how, uh, how similar someone might look, everyone sounds different. For example, Dench 
Her hair doesn't sound, for example, she sounds very, very little, but her lips are extremely high pitched, so that's what uh, really stands out. Al Gore has a slightly different colored eyes, so it, that's what's particular about him. So each face has, has a specific sound. Here's uh, a specific face that sounds C major. Both eyes sometimes don't sound exactly the same, so... So when you play these five colors together, you have this specific chord of a face, and then... Um, in this case, he sounds C major. And these are the specific frequencies of his face. Now, what I realized after hearing to so many faces is that we all have more or less the same hue. There's no black people or white people. When I uh, heard of this, when, when I tried to listen to a, a black skin, someone that says, I'm black, when I hear it, or I, I detect that they're not black. So. Many people that say that they are black, they're not actually black, and people that say that they are white, they're not actually white. Uh, even if a skin looks very, very dark, it's never ever black. It's always the same kind of hue. It's orange, so it's either very, very, very dark orange or very, very, very pale light orange. But it's never white or black. We all have different shades of orange. and. Um, if there was ever a black or a white skin, that it, it wouldn't sound. And this has never happened to me for the last 10 years that I've been hearing to different faces and skins. Now, another thing that is completely false is that cities... cities many people say that cities are grey, but that's uh, completely the opposite, I think. So, uh, one of the projects I did in 2007 was to travel around Europe trying to detect the colour of cities and I scanned each city by walking through the streets and trying to detect the main color of a, of a city and I never ever detected gray. Many people um, think that uh, unsaturated stone is gray but it's never purely gray. Uh, what people call gray are usually unsaturated blues or unsaturated browns but they're, they, are, they all have some kind of tone so it's never purely gray. So what I did was just to try to define each city by two dominant colors so like Lisbon has um, light yellow and turquoise, London is very red and yellow, Madrid is amber and terracotta, each city has more than one specific uh, or dominant color. Also, after years of hearing color, I started having a secondary effect, which is I heard that my telephone line felt green because it sounded green. Telephone lines sound like, a, well, in Spain sound like a, a, so the note A to me felt green, uh, but the telephone was not green. And this started to happen with more and more things. I went to a concert, and uh, each note that I was hearing, I felt a color to, for, for each note. So it started to happen with music and with people that were talking to me. When someone was talking to me, I felt that her or his voice was orange or red because that person was talking in, in a specific frequency. So I started to paint music because I, I could uh, transpose what I was hearing to a canvas, <clears throat> so what I did was note by note transpose music into color. Like this is uh, Mozart's Queen of the Night from the center to the last note, so it's note by note. And then this is also uh, this is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber transposed into color. So from the first note to the last, which is strangely it comes out quite pink, which is a uh, also, the voices of people, so I, I tried to started transposing speeches into color. So the one on the left is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream transposed into color. Martin Luther King used to speak between C and E, that's why the, the, the painting comes out very blue, pink and uh, purple. Whereas Hitler, which is the one on the right, had very many different frequencies in a very short amount of time. So when you transpose Hitler's speeches into color, they come out in a very, very colorful uh, painting. Now, in, three years ago, we 
created the Cyborg Foundation with Moon Ribas, which is a foundation that wants to uh, help humans extend their senses by applying technology to the body. So we want to help humans become cyborgs. We also want to defend cyborg rights, so the right to appear on passport photos, the rights to, to enter any shop without having a problem. Also, we want to promote cyborgism as an art movement and a social movement, because we believe that uh, now artists have the chance to express themselves through senses that have not existed before. So we are in a very uh, specific moment in art history where we don't need to express ourselves through the senses that we have expressed ourselves for the last thousands of years. Now we can actually create new senses and therefore create new art through new senses, which is a, a unique moment with we think is cyborgism. So, for example, we can extend our hearing or our vision and create works of art that no one can actually perceive except the artist. Or if I can hear ultrasounds or infrasounds, I could compose music for dogs. So I could share the experience of an art uh, composition or a, a, composi a music composition. I could share it with a dog that could perceive it. Or you could create works of art that are only visible for bees or specific animals that can perceive ultraviolet or infrared or for any other cyborg that has this extra sense. So we believe that there's a whole world to explore through cybernetic extensions and a whole world where we can express ourselves in different ways. Some of the senses we are developing are radars, so like this is the internal radar which Moon Ribas has been wearing and experienced. Uh, it just allows you to detect movement with your eyes shut, so it gives you a whole new different experience of movement. Movement is usually a visual element that you see, but if you have movement detectors that vibrate whenever there's movement, it gives you a completely different experience of movement, and it allows you to also be more specific on uh, what you feel. So you, depending on the interval, you can actually detect the exact speed of any movement in front of you. She also appears in her passport, so when she was wearing it permanently, she was able to travel around with her cybernetic extension. Also, the interesting thing of this is that if you turn around the earrings, then you can detect movement behind you, which is having 360 degree perception of movement, which is something that us humans have not got. We all have, our senses are focused on what we have in front of us, and we have no kind of sense of what we have behind. But we could all have this extra sense if we added a small infrared detector that vibrated whenever there was movement. So with very simple technology, we can extend our senses. And with these new senses, we can express ourselves and create works of art. Also, we created the ear board, which is like the eye board, but the other way around. It transposes uh, sound into color. So you could go to a concert or fill in a, an auditorium or a concert hall with deaf people so the deaf people could experience a concert by visualizing the main frequencies of sound that are happening in front of them. Or also detect someone's voice One by day, looking at the color of the, even the state of person's state pitch. Sweltering. Also, we are developing cybernetic eyes for blind people because if you, for example, if you use this uh, electronic eye with someone that was able to see colors when they were children, what this does is activate the memory. So if someone has um, the color red in their mind, so they remember red, but they can't see red, this helps them revisualize the color so they can actually see the color that they used to see when they were children. So it can actually help them uh, gain the memory of the colors they, can, they, they used to see. Also, you can create cybernetic eyes that detect other things other than color. You could use them to detect uh, distance or obstacles or even words. So instead of translating a whole book into Braille or translating a menu into Braille, you could simply use an electronic eye and, and listen to the menu through bone conduction instead of having to translate everything into another language. Also, you could use a completely different chip and just have simultaneous translation so that you can read in Russian or Chinese simultaneously through bone conduction instead of blocking your own ears. So other projects are also the iWork app. You can actually download it if you have Android, it's free, and it allows you to have a similar experience as this, so you can hear the colors around you without having to uh, have a specific antenna attached on your head. 
also uh, we developed this fingerboard with a friend he has a finger missing but now he has 10 fingers again one of them is a bionic finger it's not a cyborg finger yet but it has a kind of electronic camera that allows him to film with his own hand but we're still developing it further so that the aim is that the camera will give him some kind of feedback and will he'll be able to feel something that he cannot feel now now it's just allowing him to take pictures but this is still not enough also one of the aims is to have the internal compass a small sensor that will vibrate whenever you face north so if you are disorientated or you are in a new city you can just turn around and whenever you feel a vibration you know that you're facing north and this can help a lot uh, in orientation and also at night uh, when you, there's no sun or there's no way of knowing where the north is um, also internal light which is a very simple element it's not cybernetic and it's not bionic but it's something that really uh, interests me that I, I have many um, tooth missing so I, I would just want to replace them with some kind of tooth that will have some light so in case of total darkness I can just click and then I can use my own mouth to have some emergency light which is a very simple element that I think we have a, an empty space in our body it's just stupid to replace it with something similar to what you had it's much better to replace it with something that you didn't have and then it might help you have something extra so having light inside would definitely help us in, in cases where we don't have light also the seismic sense is the last sense that we've been developing it's a very simple but very very emotional for us it's something that connects you to the movement of earth so whenever there's an earthquake in the world the this uh, small wrist thing vibrates so if uh, you are here but there's an earthquake in california you can feel the vibration of the earthquake and depending on the Richter scale, the vibration will be higher or lower. And this is worn by moon rivers, and this is something that if you wear for years, or if you wear it for many, many days, and then many weeks and many years, it can actually become normal for a human to feel that there's earthquakes every 12, 15 minutes, and also to feel that actually you are uh, connected to Earth. So it's a kind of new sense that we don't really know how it will end because it's just it just started in february but i have a feeling that she might start developing a pattern and that she might start feeling that there will be an earthquake soon because if she has this um uh, connection with the uh, cybernetic extension there might be a point when she might be able to feel when or where the next earthquake will be or even just have an uh, a feeling that we we cannot predict she also develops dance through this uh, sense. So one of her pieces is that she waits on stage until there's an earthquake. And if there's no earthquake, she doesn't dance. So if you go to the performance and she doesn't dance, it's not her fault. It's the Earth's fault, because if there's no earthquake, she doesn't dance. So just to conclude, most of these senses that I've talked about, many people see them as some kind of science fiction or some kind of artificial elements that do not uh, are not natural some people think that this is very unnatural to extend our senses in such a way but we see it as a completely opposite thing we feel that becoming a cyborg can actually bring us closer to animals and to nature we don't feel that becoming a cyborg brings us closer to machines or to robots in my case having an antenna in my head doesn't make me feel closer to machines it makes me feel closer to insects that already have antennas hearing through bone conduction makes me feel closer to dolphins because dolphins can also hear through bone conduction perceiving ultraviolet makes me feel closer to many also insects and animals that can perceive ultraviolet in the future if i ever have internal light it will make me feel closer to fish that in total darkness also can create light also knowing where the north is is something that sharks can do they have uh, this electromagnetic uh, sense so they know where the north is and etc many many of these senses that we find unnatural or unhuman they are unhuman but, uh, but they are very natural they are very animal so we feel that probably becoming cyborgs will bring us all closer to other other animals and it will make us understand better what other animals feel and sense and it will allow us to perceive reality and our planet in a much greater way so i encourage you 
to think about which stances you'd like to extend and to join cyborgism and to create art and express yourself through new senses. So if you have any questions, just you can just ask. Thank you very much. <laughs>
it's plausible, it's difficult, but it's plausible that we might be able to be able to take, say, a, a, a other ma animals, those genes to, means to perceive ultraviolet at light and put them into our own eyes. Okay, so what do you think of proposals like that? Yeah, I think that's, that's what comes next after cyborgism. It's, it's not, we, we shouldn't need uh, cybernetic devices to extend our senses. We could just modify our genes. So cyborgism will last maybe 200 years maximum or 150. And then after that, there will be mo genetic modification. Hi. Uh, is it monophonic? Do you just hear one color at a time? Yeah, I decided to perceive it just as a one dominant color, but you could have stereo vision, like the dominant colors, or maybe chord, or you could also have an eye tracker that would detect where you are looking precisely, and then it could change depending on what I look at. But so, the, so what's it looking at at the moment? How do you make sure you're looking at the right thing with it? Uh, there's no right thing. I could. This would be as right as 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 as. Uh, <laughs> so I, I I can actually decide what I want to perceive. It doesn't. I don't need to perceive the colors that I'm looking at. I can perceive the colors that I'm not looking at, and this would still give me color perception, which was my aim. So my aim was not to know the color of things or to perceive the color of things. My aim was to have color perception, which is. Uh, when you say blue, I have a feeling of blue, which is something I didn't have before. And, and does it take the center of the image that that picks up now, then, or does it take the, um, the most dominant color? Dominant, or? yeah. It's not the average color, it's the dominant color, which is also different. So it, the dominant now here, yeah, it would be probably like there is blue or type of blue, and then here is more human shades of F sharp, which is. But yeah, it keeps changing. The dominant color keeps changing all the time with, in microtones. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Abison. We met uh, in the last campus party in Berlin last year, and uh, I wanted to know how was the, um, the medical surgery you had uh, during this year, and what are your next uh, objective for the next years? Well, there was a problem with the design of the antenna, which has been going on for two years now. So the design of the antenna, so it's a human antenna, which is something uh, that needed some type of new design. The main problem of the human antenna is that if there needs to be some kind of system, if someone pulls it, I won't have a kind of damage. So the problem was to design a type of antenna that would have a security system. Now this, the, the design, final design was finished like four weeks ago. Now we have to present this antenna again to the bioethical committee and they have to say yes again. So it's becoming like a nightmare, a long process. But finally, someday it will happen because uh, it's just a two hour surgery. It's not a long thing and it's, it shouldn't be that complicated. When this is done, I want to work on power. I don't want to use electricity. I want to use my own blood circulation. And then next steps uh, to be able to uh, go on the water because uh, the good thing about bone conduction is that I could hear color perfectly well on the water because I don't need air or on in space because there, there's no need of um, air. Also I want this to move. I don't, I don't want to use my hand to move the antenna. It should move on its own and maybe this, the blink so I can blink. Yeah, the exciting thing about having a cybernetic part is that the older you get, the better your senses will, will be, which is something so unusual. I mean, in theory, the older you get, the less senses you, you'll have, or the, your senses will continuously degenerate. But if, if you become cyber, it will happen the opposite. You will, I can't wait to be an old man because I know that I will be able to perceive things much better when I'm older. So this is, I think, one of the exciting things about becoming a cyborg as well, is that you look forward to being old, because technology will be much better than you'll be able to have it more developed. And uh, how long does it take for you to recharge the battery of the device? Maybe like four or five hours. Uh, it's a long time. Yeah, but so I just do other things. So uh, I'm, okay, I plug yeah. myself and, and I just...
Thank you very much, Neil Harbison. Round of applause for Neil Harbison, please. Thank you. Our next speaker will be at nine o'clock. It will be Angel Hernandez with the Campus Party Robotics. So enjoy the rest of the facilities and join us back at 9 p.m. Thank you very much.